All right, Roger Sims, hitchhiking his way home, would never forget his day. His heavy suitcase made Roger tired. He was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. Flashing the hitchhiking sign to the oncoming car, he lost hope when he saw it was a black, sleek new Cadillac. To his surprise, the car stopped. The passenger door opened. He ran toward the car, tossed his suitcase in the back, and thanked the handsome, well-dressed man as he slid into the front seat. Going home for keeps? Sure am, Roger responded. Well, you're in luck if you're going to Chicago. Not quite that far. Do you live in Chicago? I have a business there. My name is Hanover. After talking about many things, Roger, a Christian, felt a compulsion to witness to this 50-ish, apparently successful businessman about Christ. But he kept putting it off till he realized he was just 30 minutes from his home. It was now or never. So Roger cleared his throat. Mr. Hanover, I would love to, well, like to talk to you about something very important. He then proceeded to explain the way of salvation, ultimately asking Mr. Hanover if he would like to receive Christ as his savior. To Roger's astonishment, the Cadillac pulled over to the side of the road. Roger thought he was going to be ejected from the car, but the businessman bowed his head and received Christ, then thanked Roger. This is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. Five years went by. Roger married, had a two-year-old boy, and a business of his own. Packing his suitcase for a business trip to Chicago, he found the small white business card Hanover had given him five years before. In Chicago, he looked up Hanover Enterprises. A receptionist told him it was impossible to see Mr. Hanover, but he could see Miss Hanover. A little confused as to what was going on, he was ushered into a lovely office and found himself facing a keen-eyed woman in her 50s. She extended her hand. You knew my husband? Roger told how her husband had given him a ride when hitchhiking home after the war. Can you tell me when that was? It was May 7th, five years ago, the day I was discharged from the Army. Anything special about that day? Roger hesitated. Should he mention giving his witness? Since he had come so far, he might as well take the plunge. Miss Hanover, I explained the gospel. He pulled over to the side of the road and wept against the steering wheel. He gave his life to Christ that day. Explosive sobs shook her body. She cried. Getting a grip on herself, she sobbed, I had prayed for my husband's, husband's salvation for years. I believe God would save him and said, Roger, where is your husband now, Miss Hanover? He's dead. She wept, struggling with words. He was in a car crash after he let you out of the car. He never got home. You see, I thought God had not kept his promise. Sobbing uncontrollably, she added, I stopped living for God five years ago because I thought he had not kept his word. Wow. And that's an illustration from, uh, and that's a true story from, uh, J. Kirk Johnson's book, Why Christians Sin, uh, from 1992. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that God is faithful? Yes. Yes. Do you believe that he will work all things out? Yes. Yes. Because he certainly will. Think about this story of, of, of Mr. Hanover. And all of us have heard stories like this, of just wild things that happen. Last minute things, like, whoa, how could the timing be that perfect? God will certainly provide. He, he provides from his bounty, though. That's the, that's the point of our message today, is he provides from his bounty. But how often do we want to step in and try to help God, don't we? Sometimes I want to step in and say, God, you're taking a while on this prayer request, so let me help you out. Let me, let me make some moves here, and I'll help you answer. But that's not how God works. Uh, you'd be amazed, though. Um, how he does work. But often it takes time, it takes waiting, doesn't it? This is what happened with Abraham. Abraham and his wife were very advanced in years. They had no children. This was a big deal in ancient times. If you didn't have kids to carry on your family line, that's, that was considered like an insult. That'd be like people would kind of wonder about you, what's wrong with you kind of thing. Why don't you have kids? What, who's gonna carry on your family name? So at this time, it was, it was tough. And it was tragic for Abraham. Yet God had made a promise to Abraham. He said in Genesis 17, uh, verses 1 and 2, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him, saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. And Abraham's probably hearing this thinking, what are you 
you talking about? I don't have any kids. How are you going to multiply any greater? You know? Probably wondering, what's, what's going on here? And Abraham, after this moment, it changed his life. If we have an encounter with God in our lives, it changes our lives forever. But nothing changed as far as the uh, as far as him and his wife having a kid. That, that didn't change. For years and years, in fact, and nothing happened. God had made a promise, but the results weren't appearing. How often does that happen in our lives? We, we know God is going to gift us with something wonderful that we want, but we end up waiting, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and it seems like nothing's happening. That's, that's tough, isn't it? It's one of the hardest things is to wait. Yeah. yeah. And how often do we have hopes and dreams and plans, and we wait for God to make them a reality? And, and, and time passes, more time passes, years pass by, and we start to lose hope. Our faith starts to dwindle. And then we get a bad idea, and we say to ourselves, I know, I'll figure out a way to help God make this happen. That's what happened with Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis. Since God's bounty hadn't appeared yet, they decided to make their own way. Sarah invited Abraham to sleep with their servant, Hagar, and Hagar became pregnant and gave birth to this, this boy named Ishmael. They went out of God's way and made their own way, and it didn't work out too well. It caused conflict between Sarah and Abraham, and Hagar started getting mistreated by Sarah because Sarah was jealous that she was able to have a baby. And Abraham asked God to bless Ishmael, and that was not God's plan. In the end, Hagar was sent away with Ishmael. And only later was God's plan fulfilled when Isaac was born after Sarah became pregnant. The name of our God, as we consider the names of God today, is El Shaddai. That's from the Hebrew, El Shaddai. And is often translated in the Bible as God Almighty. This points us to the fact of God's ability to do miraculous things. He is able to break the laws of nature, which he created to do miraculous things in the universe he made. You get that? Does that make sense? So it is physically impossible for Sarah to have a baby when she is an old grandma. She's an old lady. But God breaks the physical laws of the human body and brings about the birth of a baby. He is God Almighty, able to do anything he desires by breaking the rules of his own systems. That is what a miracle, when you hear about a miracle in the Bible, that's what that means. God is temporarily breaking the laws of nature to allow for a miraculous event. God often will suddenly provide something that seemed impossible. That is a miraculous event. Yet there is also a deeper meaning to the name of God, El Shaddai. El Shaddai also means the God that brings forth his bounty and riches out of himself to us. Abraham and Sarah learned this, that what they desired could never come from their own efforts. It had to be a gift from God. It had to be a gift from God. It had to come from his bounty, from his storehouse, from his wealth, not from themselves. That is who God is to us today. In your life, right now, God is the one who will call you, who will confirm you, and who will create in you what you need. And he calls on us to wait on him, and then later God will provide from his own bounty. This points us forward to the New Testament, where Jesus Christ would come and would provide our salvation for us as a free gift. Not something from our own efforts, but a gift we receive from God. Our God is El Shaddai, God Almighty, who perfectly forms the systems of the universe and is able to change the rules to create miracles in our lives. And he is God who provides from his own bounty, not from our efforts or plans, but from himself as we wait patiently on him to provide. We receive it as a free gift. That is how it works. So in conclusion, the author of names of God Nathan Stone said this. So we see that the name Almighty God speaks to us of the inexhaustible stores of his bounty of the riches and fullness of his grace 
in self-sacrificing love, pouring itself out for others. It tells us that from God comes every good and perfect gift, and that he never wearies of pouring his mercies and blessings upon his people. But we must not forget that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. His sufficiency is made most manifest in our insufficiency. His fullness in our emptiness, that being filled from us may flow rivers of living water to a thirsty and needy humanity. And that is the truth, brothers and sisters. We so often want to try to create what we want in life, don't we? We try to figure it out and make our little plans and force things to go our own way, don't we? And it never works quite like we want it to, does it? No, it doesn't. And only out of our insufficiency, only out of our weakness, only out of our difficulty, only out of our struggle, only out of our surrender comes uh, almighty uh, sufficiency. Almighty sufficiency. It is only by his power. 